at the 15th verse and ending at verse 23. Numbers chapter 9. And after you have found it, uh, let us all stand. And since most of you use the King James, mine is the NIV and the message, so that I won't throw you off. I'm just going to be, well, myself along with others. Let's read uh, from this. Numbers chapter 9, beginning at the 15th verse. Let us read it together. On the day the tabernacle the tent of the testimony was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night, it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Whenever the clouds settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out. And at his command, they encamped. As long as the clouds stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp. And then at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening to morning. And when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. And when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped. And at the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. Amen. You may be seated. A strong faith, a strong faith for a brutal wilderness. A strong faith for a brutal wilderness. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not go. But when they lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped. And at the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. The wilderness demands a strong faith. The scripture that we just read together gives somewhat of a sketchy outline of the Israelites' journey through the wilderness. What these verses that were read, what they lack in substance, we can find the complete picture in Exodus chapters 12, 13, and 14. But in order that we understand what these scriptures, what is talk, what they're talking about, and to put them in context, let me give some background to this narrative. The Israelites, they have been in slavery in Egypt for 430 years, we're told. 
which means that breaks down to what? Four centuries and three decades. Uh -huh. And having been in slavery that long, their spirits had been broken by slavery. And it was not easy for them to turn their hands suddenly from making bricks to, to taking up a sword and fighting. The Philistines were too fierce to be encountered by raw recruits mm -hmm. in the land of Canaan. Now, there were two ways that they could have gone from Egypt into the land of Canaan. The first route was the shortest, and it went from the north of Egypt to the south of Canaan. And the short route took approximately about four to five days. But then there was a second route, which was much longer than the first route. This is the route that God chose, the one that went through the wilderness because God has some directions he needed to give his people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now there are many reasons why the God guided them through the wilderness and let me suggest a few of them. First of all, the reason why God guided them the long way through the wilderness is because the Egyptians were to be drowned in the Red Sea. Secondly, the Israelites had to be humbled and proved in the wilderness, and their pride had to be devastated. And you'll find that in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. And then thirdly, matters had to be settled between God and his people. Fourthly, God had to give his laws. He had to give ordinances and institute them such as the Passover. His covenants had to be sealed. And the original contract that was ratified with his people, that had to be done. So the long route was necessary. Amen? Amen. And when we look at this, God knew that it would take 40 years for the people, and he knew that it would take this long to forge a nation of fighting, praying people that would depend on him and his mighty right hand. Again, the Philistines who were already in Canaan, they were a fighting machine that could only be conquered by a disciplined and trained army. The wilderness for the Israelites was their training school. It was their training ground. But I want us this morning to notice something in the text, something that's very strange and peculiar in the movement of God's people. They had no maps, they had no compass, there was no road through the wilderness. There was no track to guide them. There was only one thing to mark their direction, and that was a cloud. And I want you to seal that in your thoughts, a cloud. Now we wanna look at this divine, the history of this divine cloud that God had for them. This cloud was no ordinary cloud that we look up in the sky and we see. And the reason why we know it was not an ordinary cloud because it's evidenced by the fact that it suddenly appeared at the completion when the tabernacle had been finished and was set up. Then the cloud came down, covered the tabernacle, and went on the inside and filled the tabernacle. And also, not only that, but at night, the cloud had an appearance of fire. Cloud by day, fire by night. 
God used this divine cloud to direct the movement of his people, their marches, their encampments, and to let them know that by any means, he was the one that was going to bring them out. And we find that in verses 17 and 18 of our text. Now there are many lessons that we can learn in this drama. And these lessons are important for the growth of my faith and your faith and understanding the ways of God's leading in all of our lives. First of all, the cloud symbolized God's presence with his people. The cloud was a sign of God's presence with his people. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35, it says God makes the statement. He says that I will never leave you, neither will I forsake you. Now notice this, the very nature of God and his character validate the fact that God is true to his word. God cannot break his word. Can I repeat that again? God, just like God can't lie, he cannot break his word. Why? Because God and his word are one. You remember in the book of Genesis chapter 1, you remember every time God would speak, something would happen? He spoke, this would appear, he spoke, that would appear, but nothing appeared nor happened until God, what? Gave his word. When his word was given, things started, what? Started happening. And that's what God does in your life and my life. God, when he speaks, things happen in our lives. As I was listening to, uh, who was that? Somebody was talking about in terms of their scholarship. Nikitra, that's right. And she was talking about that she was uh, uh, applying for all these jobs. She had all of those applications. No, nobody called her back, asked her for coming. Well, you know what? God didn't want her to get a job because he had already worked it out for the scholarship. When God speaks, and I don't care how high government is, I don't care how powerful men are, when God speaks, he can bring the loftiest kings down, he can destroy nations, he can uproot them like he told Jeremiah, I'm calling you to be a prophet and I'm calling you to tear down, to uproot, then to build in terms of my word. Lesson number two, the cloud went before them to show the way. When they came out of Egypt, and as a cloud was guiding them to the Red Sea, the narrator tells us that when they got to the Red Sea, the cloud was in front of them. When they got to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea, they didn't know how they were going to get across on the other side. And to show you how, uh, and choir, you were saying this, how awesome God is, he took the cloud, and instead of being in front, he brought the cloud behind them. And when he brought it behind them, we are told that on the side where the Israelites were, it was light. On the other side, where the Egyptians were, it was darkness. So it looked like the cloud had what, a, 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 a type of two layer type of thing, light on one side and darkness on the other side. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, it says, this is the way, walk in it. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, what? The truth and the life. And then in Psalm 37 and 5, it says, commit your way to the Lord. Then in Deuteronomy 1.33, it says, to show you the way you should go. God's way is the right way. And sometimes I think we as mortals, we forget 
that are, uh, and, our, and our main mission of this in the uh, eulogy Thursday uh, at uh, Brother Daly's funeral. Uh, you, how many of y'all remember that sitcom back in the 50s, uh, Father Knows Best? You remember that one? Yeah. Well, you can paraphrase that and you can say, God knows best. But many times we don't want to listen to God in terms of what he tells us to do. We think we got it figured out. And let me tell you, because I've been down that road, anytime you think you got your life figured out mm -hmm. and everything is going to arrive at a climax that you know or you figure that down the road, every time God will step in, he'll tear it up, and he'll show you that your wisdom is not the best wisdom in the world. For we are told in uh, Proverbs, the third chapter, verse five and six, what? Lean not to what? Your own understanding, but what? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. Though at times we look at what God does and it doesn't make sense to us, but God always leads his people the best way. The Shekinah fire, which means it was symbolizing the power and the presence of God. If God brings you into a wilderness, he will not leave you there, nor will he lose you there. He will lead you through it. I'm going to repeat that again. When God leads you into a wilderness, whether it's personal or whether it's a church wilderness, he will not leave you there, neither will he lose you in the wilderness. He will lead you through that wilderness. We're told by his word that we must live by faith. Does it say we must live by wisdom? We must live by cunningness, trickery, chicanery. We must live by what? Faith. And what is faith? According to God's word. Faith is what? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When we walk by faith, we have to trust God that he will keep his promise and that he will act on his word when he says he will do it. Amen? If we can trust a man, how come we can't trust God? If you can trust a man to draw up a contract and to say, you're going to buy a car, or buy a house, whatever the case might be, Drop a contract, and this man tells you, put your John Henry down here, etc. And he'll tell you uh, whatever your payments are per month and how long you got to pay it. And you trust him because he drew up a piece of paper. Amen? But you can't trust God that owns the man and the paper. That doesn't make sense, does it? You see how, 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 how fallacious that is? God led them at the rate they could follow. Let me say that again, because I think that flew over the heads of somebody. God led, well, let, let me say it another way. He didn't lead them any faster than they could go. Let me say it another way. God will never lead you any quicker than your faith will trust him. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Let me say it a fourth way. <laughs> some, some still ain't got it. To follow God, first of all, you got to let God be God. He's not going to force you. But he also knows your nature. And believe it or not, he knows the fallacies in our faith. Mm -hmm. Now, 
when I look in this room, everybody in this room does not have a great faith. And somebody is thinking right now, uh-oh, he's beginning to talk about me. No, I'm not talking about you. That's just human nature. Everybody doesn't have a great faith. Because scripture tells, Paul talks about that. He talks about the strong, the weak, this sort of thing. There will always be some individuals that are part of the body of Christ that will just trust him as long as they can see what God is doing. If they see it, then they will trust him. But if they don't see it, then they have reservations about it. Faith is not seeing. Faith is what? Faith is believing. Amen? So the cloud, what, went before them to show them what? The way. There's a song that we sang, let Jesus lead you what? From what? Earth to glory. Lesson number three, not only did the cloud lead them, it also protected them. At the Red Sea, the cloud, the cloud rather, went behind them to protect them from the Egyptians. It moved from in front to the rear to guard their flank. God not only guides us, but he does not hold the pass against us. Maybe I should say that again. Didn't get too many amens on that one. God not only guides you and me, but he does not convict us. He does not condemn us. He does not judge us according to our past. Let me say it like this. Everybody in this room has a past history. Nobody here was born like an embryo and just popped into being full grown. You started from something. Amen? And let me say something else. Everybody here didn't start out being born again. Okay, let me, let me say it this way. How many of you, when you came out of your mother's womb, you were already saved? Raise your hand. I didn't think so. I didn't think so. In other words, it took time. It took what? Training and tutelage, maybe, and, and, if, and you were blessed to come up in what? A Christian home, a religious home, where whoever your guardians, your parents were, where they taught you God's word. They themselves loved the word of God. Now, everybody wasn't blessed to come up in a Christian home. Amen? Amen? But whether you came up in a Christian home or not, all of us at one time or another before we were actually saved and trusted God, we went astray. I'm looking at some folk and they act as though, no, I ain't never going astray. I've been, I've been holy ever since I've been in this world. Well, you, hey, keep on fooling yourself. Psalm 103 says he removes or he separates our transgressions from us as far as what? The east is from the west. If God was to hold my past against me, I wouldn't be standing here now. I'd possibly be dead. And I guess most of us here would not be living if he was to hold our past against us. God does what he knows is best in order what? To structure us, to fashion us, to form us into the people that he wants us to be. God has a blueprint for every life in this room. Did you know that? He's got a purpose. He's got a plan for your life 
and for my life. Now, he's not going to reveal the plan at the beginning. He's not going to roll it out like a carpet, the red carpet, and let you see all of it. He's not going to do that. He's just going to what? He's just going to let you see what? One step at a time. Because, you, and, 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 and this is my take on that. If I knew everything that God was going to do in my life from the cradle to the grave, then why trust him? Except if I get in a pinch, then I go and call on him in terms of delivering me out of a very, uh, let's say maybe a very hairy situation. But beyond that, if I already know what my end is going to be before my beginning starts, then why trust God? And the, and, and the point is this, God knows what my beginning is before my beginning began. Does that make sense? Egypt in our text represents the world. Egypt represents slavery. And any time one is in the world and you love the allurements of the world, then you are in bondage and slavery to the gods of the world. And you remember Egypt had a whole lot of gods. And you remember the plagues that God sent? Those, each one of those nine plagues was aimed at one particular God that Egypt worshiped. And he was trying to show his people, I am greater than all of their little gods put together. And let me show you in terms of how awesome I am. And he destroyed each one of their gods. The world has many gods. In fact, sometimes in our homes we have too many gods. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we don't want to admit it. But uh, when you let God be God, how do you let God be God? How do you let God be God? Surrendering. Surrendering. Thank you. Surrendering to God's will. In other words, Lord, here I am. Take over. I don't know what you want to do, but I'm your what? I'm your vessel, and whatever it is that you have planned for my life, I'm willing to surrender to that will. That's how it is done. Number four, God uh, surrounds us with his keeping love in the midst of brutal circumstances. God surrounds us with his keeping love in the midst of brutal circumstances. Now, when you go back and read Numbers 9, it says that after the tabernacle was finished, then the cloud that hovered, that stood above the tabernacle, came down, covered the tabernacle, consume the inside. In fact, the presence of God was so powerful in covering the tent of meeting, which the tabernacle is the same thing, just different terminology, until Moses couldn't even go through the entrance because of God's presence, God's power. Why did God do that? Because he knew that his people, that ahead of them there was going to be a test that was going to test every fiber of their being. And there are some wildernesses <laughs> in life that will test every fiber of your faith. And if you think you're strong, go through the wilderness. If you think that, you, that the roots of your faith go deep, go through the wilderness. The wilderness is barren, it's dry, it's hot. There's nothing living in the desert. And when you're going through thirsty, barren lands in your life, and sometimes you don't even know in terms of where you're gonna get enough money from to even pay a bill, 
or you don't have any money to even buy any food. But you just got to wait and trust God that he's going to work it out. Even though that you have prayed about this situation over and over again and you haven't seen anything change, don't think that God has not heard your prayer. He hears all of our prayers if they're sincere now. If they're sincere. And something else I found out. You don't have to continue to repeat the same prayer over and over again. Did you know that? When you lay, when you lay a petition before God, he already knows in terms of how sincere your heart is. And he's already, and I use this terminology, he's already tabulated in terms of that request, and he's going to what? He's going to move and address it in his time and in his way. Amen? Now, I want to ask a question. What does the wilderness do to God's people? What does the wilderness do? I want to suggest some things that the wilderness does. Number one, sometimes the wilderness brings a desert of debilitating illness. An illness so severe that it saps all of your energy, all of your strength, have you ever been so sick till you couldn't even lift your head off your pillow? You couldn't even lift your body to get out of your own bed? Have you ever been that sick? The wilderness can drain your faith. Amen? And when your faith is drained, then that means you might just die in the wilderness. Pleasant Green, we don't want to die in the wilderness, do we? Do we want to die in the wilderness? No. All right then, stop. The wilderness can bring suffocating family confusion without warning. Things can happen not overnight, they can happen in a moment. They can happen without any forewarning and it can blindside you, it can hit you. And, and the, the, the quickest way that the enemy knows to get to a child of God or believer in Christ is to attack your home. Did you know that? Because you see, home is where you spend, I'd say at least about what, maybe 80, 85% of your time, you know, there with your children or whatever you're doing. And, and, and home relationships are more, are very intimate. They, 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 are, they, they, they are very genuine. And the quickest people to get offended is somebody in a home relationship. Let me say it this way. A husband and wife can get offended with one another over trivial things. Right. Y'all right. <laughs> act like I'm the only one that's going through this. Little nitpicking stuff. Stuff that, that, that has nothing to do with eternity. Has nothing to do with salvation. Because I didn't say good morning. You get an attitude. Uh, because you told me to go get you a glass of water and I forgot to get the glass of water. You get an attitude. I, 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 I know I'm hitting some, some, some molars now, 
that are very sensitive. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Because you see, all, all families, there's a basic structure for all of us as families. Now, we're going to differ according to personalities, but basically, all families have the same ingredients. Yeah, yeah. And that ingredient is in terms of loving one another through the good and the bad. Forgiving one another when you don't feel like forgiving. Now, that's, we encounter some of those problems within the church family. And I think there was, uh, who's that, uh, Sister Nelson, you were talking about that the person made you angry and you've been trying to purge your spirit, get that anger out of your spirit so you can forgive them. Yes, that's difficult, but it's not impossible. For Jesus tells us, he said, if we can't forgive one another, then don't pray and ask me to forgive you. Because you see, we got to understand that horizontal relationships come out of vertical relationship. The vertical gives precedence to the horizontal. We are who we are because of who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us on Calvary and because he loved you and me and we didn't deserve it because you know what grace is grace is a gift that you haven't earned yeah. that you don't deserve now you know there's a difference between grace and mercy mercy is what God keeps from me that I do deserve grace is what he gives me and I don't deserve it and that's the reason why we need both grace and mercy. Right. And they're, they are, they're, they're just like, I guess, maybe two sides of, uh, of the same coin. The desert of life can cripple your faith. Deserts can be brutal to relationships. And I just got through talking about that. The desert can bring loneliness and despair. The desert can take or steal your joy if you let it. That's the reason why David said in Psalm 51, restore unto me what? The joy of your salvation. Now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask, and, and I'm gonna use the terminology of uh, David Jeremiah. Class, I'm gonna ask a question and I want veracity, truthfulness out of your class. How many of you have ever lost your joy? Raise your hand. My love. My love. I think all of us have yes, at sir. one time or another. Yes, sir. And depending upon the circumstances, and you know when your joy is gone, don't you? At least I know when mine is gone. When everybody else is feeling the Holy Spirit, and I'm not feeling him. Everybody else is rejoicing. And I don't see any need for the rejoicing. Your joy is at a very low level. And you better, in fact, uh, I'm trying to think of that medical term. Uh, your joy is on life ports of system. And so you, you better, you, you better, Pray and ask God through his Holy Spirit, like David said, restore my joy. Give me back the thrill and the, the hope that I once had before. And when you have it, when he gives it, you know it. Because it's just like drinking a glass of cold water on a hot day when the temperature is about 98 or 100 degrees. And that cold water tastes like, tastes like honey from heaven, don't it? The desert will make you reevaluate your commitment to Christ. 
It will make you examine, why am I serving him? Why am I worshiping him? Why am I here today? And I'm, am I here because I came to see other folk? Or it was a business appointment? Or because it's tradition? Or it's a habit? Why am I here? You have to reevaluate and examine your commitment to Christ individually. If you allow it, the desert will also choke your witness. And you'll end up not wanting to share Christ with nobody. In fact, you won't even care in terms of whether somebody else knows about Jesus. You become isolated and alone by yourself. The desert is not a friend to God's child. No, no. The desert is brutal, it's cruel, it's harsh. And it will not, it will not, the journey is not a pleasant journey. For the Israelites, you remember, they were encountering all kinds of disasters and tragedies as they were going through the wilderness. You remember, they didn't have enough water. They didn't have anything to eat. They didn't have any meat. It was always something that they were what? that they were devoid of. But every time God, what, supplied each one of those needs. Mm -hmm. God has been supplying our needs, but there are sometimes what God supplies, we don't want it. We want something else. Or he doesn't supply enough of what I want. So in either case, we get greedy, and we call ourselves dictating to God in terms of what we want him to do. But I'm glad that God does not, he does not succumb to our pettiness. He does not allow himself to be dictated to, for he's the master, and we are what? His children. We need him, he doesn't need us. Because if you remember, before he created the world, before he spoke and everything came into being, he was God all alone by himself. Remember that? He wants us to work with him, cooperate with him, but God's not going to beg us. He wants us to do as the children of Israel were requested to do. Trust me. Obey me. Trust me for my promise. I told you I'd do this. I'm going to do it. Wait on me what? To work it out. Finally, the cloud that was moving, it did two other things. It sheltered the people from the heat during the day and it gave them light by night and it constantly made the wilderness they were going through less fearful and less frightening. When God walks by your side, I don't care how, how ugly the circumstances are, how strange, how fearful things are around you. If God is by your side, yeah, yeah. he will give you the peace, the tranquility. He will give you the inner calm that you need to cope with those things that are happening around you. In fact, he can give you peace and all hell is breaking around you. He can give you joy and when everybody else is looking mean and nasty and doing nasty and mean things or saying mean things. He can still give you joy. He, he can enable you to laugh at someone who spits in your face. God can do that. And did you not know that God is able 
to do whatever he promises he's going to do. Did you know that? Now, let me conclude with this. We know that as a church, we are going through a wilderness stretch. Amen? Amen. And everything ain't working out the way we want it. Amen? Amen? But we said we're trusting God. Yeah. Is that what we said? Yeah. Now, if we trust him, we got to what? Lean on his promise. And we got to let God work it out his way. He knows what we need. He knows the anxiety and the anxiousness of our spirits. You don't have to tell him that. He's fully aware of it. In fact, he knew that was going to happen before it happened in each of us. He's aware of that. He knows that. But he also says, I'll what? I'll never leave you, neither will I forsake you. Now, you believe it or you don't believe it. It's just that simple. There ain't no in between on, on, in terms of faith. I believe it sometime, I don't believe it the other times, or if I can see it, if I can feel it. And then that's something else. These feelings got to go in the trash can. You cannot follow God by feeling. God ain't no doctor feel good. He's an awesome God. And he has all power. And he can do exactly what he says. And at the moment when you don't think God is getting ready to reveal himself through symbolically his cloud, that's when God will show you that he's able to do exactly what he promised. And it will suddenly, you remember that song where it says that that uh, um, I think it talks about in terms of ye saints, ye fearful saints, take courage fresh anew for the clouds that ye so much dread will break with blessings upon your head. Judge not the Lord by your feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. For behind a frowning providence, he has what? A smiling face. You believe it or you don't? No in between. God doesn't allow fence travelers. You either in the camp or you're outside of the camp. You either follow the cloud or else you charter your own course. But let me tell you, if you try to charter your own course, oh, you got some, you got some sleepless nights and you got a lot of pain ahead of you. Now, somebody might say, well, I got pain if I follow God. We live in a fallen world. I understand that. But even with God and the pain, he is able to what? To help you to bear that. For he says in, in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, he said he will not put more on you than you are able to bear. But he will with what? The temptation. Make a way to escape what? That you might be able to what? To bear up under it. God knows in terms of how much pressure to put on each of us in our lives. He knows in terms of how long we can take stress and strain. And just at that moment when you think you can't take any more, what does he do? He brings an oasis. Sweet oasis. And he lets you rest. And he refreshes your soul. And then he says, okay, get up. We got some more traveling to do. This journey doesn't end here. You understand what I'm saying? This journey of ours doesn't end until he says, well done. And all of us should be what? Fighting for the prize. 
For Paul says, I have what? I have run a good race. I have fought a good fight. And now it's time for me what? To be extracted from this earth. And there's a crown what? Waiting for me. But then he said, not only for me, you know, I'm not self and I'm not the only one that he's gonna that he's gonna crown, but for all what? Who love his appearance. Do you love the Lord? You ain't joshing me now. You ain't just saying that, are you? Do you really love him? If you do, you will obey him. If you really love him, you will trust him. If you really love him, you will let him work out his purpose and plan in your life. Calvary was a symbol of God's grace. It wasn't a cloud, but it was a man who died on a cross, gave his life. And the people that he gave his life for didn't ask him to die, didn't pay him to die didn't beg him to die but he did it because he loved them greater love have what no man than this that a man laid down his life Jesus laid down his life for you and me now the question is are you going to live for him He's already paid the price. He's gone through his wilderness. He went through his wilderness on the cross when he cried out and said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? He's already gone through his wilderness. But he says that if, if you have me as your companion as, and as your guide, he said, I can carry you through your wilderness and I can let you know that you will what? come out on the other side. Somebody here this morning does not know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Knowing him is richer than a honeycomb. Knowing Jesus is greater than having a million dollars. Because see that million dollars, you can't carry that with you to the grave. And when you leave it here, somebody else is gonna blow it quicker than you could amass it. But Jesus will go with you all the way, all the way from earth to glory. If you're afraid of dying, Jesus can calm your fears. He can let you know that death holds no sting because one day he got up out of the grave and he said, all power is in my hand. So don't have to worry about death. Death can't hurt a child of God. Death doesn't do anything but just like our urshers back there in the back. It would just usher you into the presence of God. If you're here, will you come?